Amen. Come on, put your hands one more time and give the Lord a good praise, y'all, friend. When I look at those pictures, you can't help but think about my daddy. And some of you guys, you know, your dad, maybe they're not here. But, uh, you know, we think about Father's Day. And for those, real quickly, uh, for those who know uh, a little bit about Father's Day, it simply started by a lady, amen, by the name of Sonora Smart Dot. And all she wanted to do was honor her father. She, wanted to, she asked the church leaders, can we have a special service to, to honor her father, which was a civil rights, a uh, civil war veteran. Uh, but what she wanted to honor him because his wife has passed, giving birth to the last child. And he raised all six children by himself. And so her heart idea was just to honor a man who was willing to sacrifice, willing to be faithful and to be there at his post. And, and the idea came from that, amen. And then in 1972, President Nixon went ahead and, and made it an official holiday. But this morning, as we've seen those pictures, I want to go ahead and just recognize and be more specific here to, uh, this morning and as we honor and recognize specific fathers in this way. Because we have the fathers that we want to recognize that are still in it. Amen. They're still, you're here right now. Amen. And your father is still here. Amen. So we want to recognize that, that that's very privileged. You have very privileged to be able to be that, to be that complete unit and to be able to still have your father with you. We want to recognize and honor those fathers who maybe went to be the Lord. My father, it's almost two years that he, went, he passed. And, and one thing I couldn't really thank God for is that he knew the Lord. He accepted the Lord. I'm going to share a little bit about that a little later. But he accepted the Lord and I knew that he was, that he was in the presence of God. And so we want to honor those who went on to be with the Lord. We want to recognize those fathers who maybe you grew up without a father. Maybe you grew up feeling that your father was absent. You didn't have a father. And that's not easy. But yet you still made it. We want to recognize you and honor you. We want to recognize and honor the father who fathers from a distance. Maybe for some reason you can't be there with your children on a day-to-day -day basis. We want to recognize that I know that the Lord knows that it's hard. Especially the men's home who are there in the men's home. And you have children and you have children that you can't be with. And I know that it's going to be tempted and you want to meet those needs. You want to be there for them. But right now you are doing and you are investing into those children right where you're at. By you being here and submitting your heart and, God and life unto the Lord, I want you to know that God, amen, is taking care of them. And you may be tempted to leave. I was talking to someone the other day and, and they, I, want, I feel like I'm not meeting the needs of my kids. And I told them, listen, you may want to meet the needs but without God, you can't give them what they need. You can't give them that godly father. You may, it's easy to meet needs. I mean, there's fathers out there that are meeting needs. But is it what, the, what, the, what, the, what they need? And that can only happen through God. We also want to go ahead and just recognize and honor, amen, uh, those who are stepfathers. Amen. Who, those who biologically, they're not, that's not the chin, but they embrace them, they are. They embrace like their own kids. They, the kids love them like their father. I want to go ahead and recognize and honor them. And then also, as Pastor Manning mentioned, the single parents. Single parents, the single moms, amen. You are the mother, the father of the family, amen. You are the ones that are holding it together, amen. And we want to go ahead and just honor you with that. Can we go ahead and just put our hands together for the Lord? Because if you've seen that picture, there's many pictures that came up there. And I think that we need just to recognize and more specifically here this morning. And the theme of tonight, uh, this morning is a father ties the family together. How many got a tie? You got to get ties when you walked in? We're blessed with ties. Amen. That's the theme. That's what we want to kind of surround it with a theme. And the theme is a family ties a family together. And when you think about a tie, amen, a tie originated in the 1700s. And it was, it was just originally brought so that you can put something around your neck and hold your jacket together to be able to, to protect you or to keep you together. It wasn't that big of an idea, but King Louis decided to say he liked it and had his whole army go ahead and wear ties, amen? It didn't look like this, but it was a certain tie. But originally, it was to hold the jacket together. It had a purpose, amen? And then, and then but throughout the 70s, uh, 700, 800, and 900s, the, the, the tie symbolized a social status, and it, it, it symbolized wealth, power, and prestige. I'm going somewhere with this. In the 700, 800, and 900s, in those decades, in those, in those uh, centuries, it symbolized wealth, power, and prestige. In the 50s and 80s, the tie symbolized nobi uh, nobility, honor, and order. 
But today, the tie has been reduced to just an accessory, a fas part of fashion. It's no longer the status that it used to hold before. And I look at that and I say, that's because that's the world that we live in here this, more, or this day. The world that we live in is a, is a world that at one time things stood for something. At one time things meant something. At one time we held things in high regards. But we are living in a, a, a time where society is, is being corroded by immorality. Where things that were good are bad and bad are good. Where things are being redefined. I'm here to say here tonight that there is an attack on fatherhood. I want to get a little bit more personal this morning because I really believe that God placed this in my heart. As I look, there is an attack on fatherhood. We honor the fathers. We hold them in high esteem. We, we, we honor them what they were able to do. But I'm here to tell you that, listen, Satan and this world, there's an attack on what fathers should be. It's not surprising that the strategy of Satan is to come in and to hit the head of the home or to hit God's plan as a man being the priest over his home. I got a couple of stats here that I want to go ahead and just share with you. And as I begin to really dig in, you know, it's funny that when you ask God for a word, you start off somewhere and he takes you somewhere else. And I begin to think about this area of being a father of being able to be what God intended you to be. You know that 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of all runaway children are from fatherless homes. 85% of all children with behavioral disorder are from fatherless homes. 71 of high school dropouts are from fatherless homes. 75% of all adolescent or, or, or drug abuse Patients and treatments right now in centers come from fatherless homes. And 85 of all youth in prison come from fatherless homes. These stats tell us that a father plays such an important role, has so much influence in, in God's plan for the family. I looked at some mother studies and it says like this. It says if a mother goes to church, if the, if, if the mother is the only one that goes to church, 18% of the chances that the children will go also. If a father goes to church, it jumps up to 66% chance that the children will go to church. If both parents, and, uh, both parents go to church, it's 79% of the, that children will come to church. Fatherhood is being under attack for today's society wants to change God's plan for the family. Do you agree? If you don't look, if you, I mean, you just got to watch the news. You got to look in the way the world is going. It, 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 is, it wants to redefine what a family unit is about. It's not surprising that Satan is trying to destroy God's ordained family and redefine what that is and how important a father is. Turn your Bibles to Romans 8. I'm just going to share a couple of scriptures. I don't want it to be long. I just want to, I want to just share my heart and hit a couple of points. In Romans chapter 8, verse 14 it says, for as many that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Listen to this. For as many that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, whom we cry, Abba, Father. Let's pray. Father, I come before you, God, here tonight or this afternoon, and I ask Holy Spirit that you would move me to the side. That you would enable me, Lord God, to communicate the simple word, Lord, but yet an important word. That every heart and every mind, every father, Lord God, and everybody in this would be stirred to know that, Lord, you have called us to be holy. You have, you have given us a plan, Father God. I pray that you would raise up fathers, God. That you would raise up fathers that are bold, that love you, and that see you as Abba Father and are obedient to your will. Father, I thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. It says, when we cry, Abba, Father, and then it goes, says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You see, you know you're a child of God because his spirit dwells within you. I used to think I was a child of God growing up all the time just because I knew about him. Because I was taught about him in school, in, in grammar school, and in high school. I, I was taught about who God was and, and what he was about. And I, I, I learned the religion books, and I learned, but I never learned the Bible. So I knew about God, and I claimed to be a child of God. 
But it wasn't until I sensed the presence and the Spirit of God touched my heart. See, that's what makes you a child of God here this morning is the Spirit of God. The Bible says if you have not the Spirit of God, then you're none of His. That scripture bothered me because I'm the man I thought I was His all the time. But you know what? When the Spirit of God bear witness within my spirit, I really understood what it meant to call Him Abba Daddy. You see, Abba Father is described, in, uh, is described as an intimacy. It, it, we, we learned that when we see our Father who walked in heaven, holy is your name. We were taught to pray to Father or Abba Father. And because he's our Father, we have access. How many know that our children have access to all that we have, right? They, they have, and in that portion of Scripture, the Bible says that as sons and daughters of the living God, we are, have access to the inheritance God, there is something that God wants to give. This life is temporal. Paul says that that what we've seen is temporal. That which is unseen is eternal. And so when you look at the word Abba, many of us learned this before. Abba, it means in the Greek, it's a, a term of endearment, which simply means daddy, right? We learned that before. We looked at that before. We heard that over and over. And that, and that is because that is the only interpretation that they were able to come with. To be able to say Abba, and it came up in the Greek interpretation, just simply mean daddy. But in the original language, in the Hebrew language, I'm going to go somewhere with this. In the original Hebrew language, in the customs of the, of the Jewish people, there was, they couldn't, the original word, they could not find a word for that in the Greek. And so they called it Abba. The real, in the Jewish Dictionary in a Jewish, the word Abba is actually Abum. Everyone say Abum. I want you to listen to this real quick. The word Abum is masculine and feminine. God created Adam in his image, and so God is neither male or female. Did you know that? God is not man or female, male or female. Why? Because male was female was, was, was God created to produce life. God doesn't need male and female to produce life. He is life. He can create life all by himself. He is all sufficient. See, God, God can create life in himself. That's why he's called El Shaddai. At, it, Eve came out of Adam. Right? God created Adam out of the dirt created him out of dirt, and he said, let him make Adam in our image, and he pulled Eve out of the side of him. Adam was masculine and feminine. Let me explain that. Kind of, when, I, when I went across that, it kind of threw me off a little bit. It threw me off because this. God does not need life, need anybody to produce life. He created male and female to produce life. A man and a woman to produce life. Without it, they can't. A woman cannot produce life on her own. And a man cannot produce life on his self, right? They need each other to produce life. When you talk about Ab, Abba, womb, that means God is masculine and feminine. He doesn't need anybody to produce life. But his plan was to have a father, to have a male, to be able to produce life. That's why some of us, I mean, you go, some, some men have a little bit of feminism, I want to say, in us. All men have a little bit of feminism, right? Come on now. I'm going to say some things, but listen, I've been, I've been looking at, we all have something about that. And I, some of us have us more than others. But listen, Satan uses that to lie to our children. Satan uses that whole idea. Yeah, we may be a little feminine here and there, but we are not women. Today's society is looking to destroy what God wants to do in a family unit. Listen, God's plan was to create male and female to produce life. God got each, God, God, each male and female, father and mother, to play an important role. My son, once she came in... in uh, he, he was telling me about this documentary that said, what is woman? You guys ever hear about it? What is woman? And they, and they couldn't answer the question, what is a woman? And so I dug, I said, okay, I want to find, how do you interpret that? What is a woman? A woman is a person who has a womb to produce life. 
What makes a woman and what makes a man is your ability and God-given role to produce life. I want to go somewhere with this because I want you to understand how important it is to be a father. I just went over the statistics of what it, take, what it is to be fatherless. For a home, to, for a child not to have a father in his life. You see, women can't produce life in themselves. They need men. And a man can't produce life because they need women. They may want to, but they can't. I say all that to say this is that we need to understand that the role of a fatherhood is, is under attack. And not only is it under attack, it's being redefined. It, it, it's saying that we're not as important. We really don't need the fathers there. Someone else can do it. No, I'm here to tell you, listen, God's role for a man was to be there, was to be able to be a father who would love, who would lead, who would protect, and who would provide. Society wants, society wants to redefine that. Only God can produce life. And Satan wants to, to divide and distort God's intended plan. Why? See, because when two people come together, they become one, right? Father, husband, and wife, mother, father, they become one and produce life. See, only God can do it on himself. And they're going to find a way that someone can be a father or a mother on their own. They want to be gods. And when I looked at it, Antichrist, who's anti Antichrist, the Bible says, is going to sit on the throne and he's going to declare himself to be who? God. There's an attack on the, fam on the fatherhood. And society is right there. Unless we as men of God begin to really lift up the standard in our hearts and minds and be able to see that God Abba is our father. He cries. It's not us wanting to. The spirit inside you knows who his father is. Your spirit cries Abba Daddy because he put it there. See, Abba in the Jewish custom, the traditional Abba, is not just a term of endearment, but it's much more than that. And I'm going to show you this real quick, and I won't be long, but it's more than just calling him daddy. In the Jewish custom, this is what it means. When a, when a father is teaching his son or instructing his son, he'll tell him like this. If, if, you, if I ask you to do something, or I tell you to do something, I want you to answer and call me Abba. Why is that? And I'm looking, why, why, are they, why, why, do, why are they so strong with that? Because Abba doesn't just mean daddy. Abba means, if you ever notice, it says Abba father. Abba means daddy, intimacy, but also obedience. And I'm going to show you what I mean. You see, you cannot call him Abba without being obedient. I'm going to show you a couple of scriptures. I'm not going to be long, but I want to show you this because I think it's very important now in this day, in this hour. When you give an instruction, he tells you to do something, you need to call him Abba, Father. When you call him Abba, it's not just a reflection on intimacy, but it's also a reflection on, on, on obedience and his authority. As we read in Romans chapter 8, verse 12, were you able to see within, those, within that portion of Scripture that as a father, God is calling us because he's our father. He loves us. He leads us. He provides for us, and he protects us. That is the role of a father, you and I. That is our role. That is our God-given role. Why? Because that's what God did. That's what God did. When you begin to look in the Bible, turn your Bibles to Mark chapter, uh, chapter 30, Mark 14, 35. I want to just show you this real quick because I believe it's important when it comes to calling him Abba or calling him Father. The role of a father. And as I look into it, I begin to see that, look, it's more than just a term of endearment. It's more than just calling him Abba. It's like you having a child that just calls you daddy but doesn't listen to him or doesn't listen to you. If you just call him Abba but not understand the other part of it, it's like you saying, okay, he's my father, I'm dear to him, but yet I don't listen to nothing he has to say. Here this morning, we need to understand that to be a father that God called us to be, not only is it their intimacy, but there has to be some obedience. 
The other two places that I see Abba Father in, there's always that intimacy, but a challenge to be obedient. What do I mean? A challenge to do something you don't want to do. In Mark chapter 14, he says, and he went a little further, talking about Jesus. He fell on the ground and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour may pass from him. 36, and he said, Abba, Father, there it is, all things are possible for you, but take this cup from me, nevertheless, not what I will, but you will. In Romans chapter 8, when he says, Abba, Father, that we have been given the spirit, you know what he's saying? The call for obedience was to die to the flesh. He says we are no longer debtors to the flesh, but indeed you need to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Every time we call the Abba, dear Father, intimately, there's a call for obedience. And I'm going to explain, I want to share with you a little bit about my life, but, but i come to know that to be so true. Why do fathers sometimes fall short? Why, why do sometimes we don't fulfill our total obligation? Because we lack sometimes obedience. Jesus there is telling Abba, Father, Abba. He's calling the intimate. He, that. he went away and he was separate. He was intimate. And the Bible says that he called him Abba, Father. He also let him know, listen, God, if you, want, if you can take this from me, take it. But let it not be my will, but let it be yours. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul says the same thing. He says, and because you are sons, God has sent you forth into, sent forth his spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer slaves, but you are sons. And if you're sons, then you're heirs of God through Christ. For indeed, when you did not know God, you served those things by nature that are not God's. But now, everyone say, but now. But now you have known God, or are rather known by God. How is it that you try to turn again to the weak and beggar elements of this world? Every time, if you want to know God as our Father, if you want to know God in an intimate way, there's going to be a call to obedience. Obedience is the key to intimacy. I say that to say this is because I learned the hard way. I learned the hard way. You know that every time we're disobedient, it takes a little bit of us from being a father. Every time we're disobedient, it takes a little bit. Listen, there was a time where man, I raised up my kids and my children. They'll tell you. You know that thing where it said God first and then, I mean, family and then church. You ever hear that teaching, you know, God first, family? I wasn't taught that. I was taught they're all the same, God, family, church, and you give 100% to each one of them. When it came to loving God, loving my kids, I knew that I had to learn to love my kids. You know why? Because basically we only do what our parents taught us to do. So I'll be honest, I really knew how to love my kids, but I know how God wanted me to love them. I had to learn that. I had to learn how to discipline my kids out of love because I grew up, my father would chase me around with a two by four. How many can relate? <laughs> chase me around or you're, they had their own. I could only do what I was taught at the time. God had to teach me over how to bend them over and tell them, listen, mijo, I don't want to do this. This hurts me more than you. And I'd grab a paddle and I'd pat them in the butt. I had to learn how to love as a father. I remember one time I'm talking to my, my, my son, Monchi, and I just flinched, and he was like, he got scared. And it broke my heart to know that, you know, he, he thought I was going to hit him. God, I don't want my kids to be afraid of me. But how many know that we were taught to fear our parents? Do it or else. See, we have to learn how to do it all over again. We have to learn how to love. We have to learn how to lead. Yes, yes, See, when you call him Abba Father, there has to be an obedience. There was a time, man, where I stopped leading my family to the things of God. And every disobedient decision I made affected them. I'm here to tell you, listen, the devil's a liar. The devil is a liar this morning. Listen, God wants us to be a people that are obedient 
to what he called us to do. Because if not, it's not just about you. It's about your family. It's about everybody. I had to learn how to lead my family. I tell you, my kids, I tell you, like, we pray for them every morning. I go to each bed, and I pray God just, I had to, literally, they'll talk, I had to do that. Why? Because I had to learn to do that. How did I learn to do it? The Spirit of God inside me would cry, Abba, Daddy, would show me, would tell me this is what you need to do. You know, sometimes they were so involved in sports and all these other things, and, and I hear people say, well, i got to back off because my kids are involved. Man, I never backed off, and I was involved in all of it. I had four of them, everything. I was at four different parks. This park, that park, that park, that park. Why? Because it wasn't about family, God, family, and church. It was all of them. I was accountable for each and every area, and I had to do it 100%. I had to learn that. I had to learn how to provide. Because as a father, we can become very selfish. Without the Spirit of God telling you how to provide, we become a very selfish people. Men, you know what I'm talking about. Without the presence of God in our life, we become very selfish. When we say we love our family, when we say I want to provide for our family, but our actions do the opposite. That's the same way it is with God. We say, God, I love you. You're my daddy. You're my father. But yet we don't, aren't, we're not obedient. To have true intimacy, to have a true level of intimacy determined, is determined by your obedience. Had to learn to provide. And no one listened. That, that, that was, everything I had was for my family, for the ministry. I tell you this. If you've got kids and they're involved in sports, they're your ministry. And my kids can tell you, I never, I never, I ne they can never say I didn't have enough time for them. Because as, as busy as ministry can be, when they're your ministry, you're their faithful. Not only that I have to learn how to be a provider, but I have to leave it a protector. And this is the part that hurts me the most. Because when you're disobedient to God, you leave your family wide open. Fathers, I'm telling you this. When, 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 God, when, when God is telling you how to lead and how to provide and how to love, and over and over in daily life, and you're disobedient, we leave our families open. We leave them unprotected, and, and that's what I did. I left my family unprotected. And because of that, I see the consequence of it. I see the consequence of my disobedience. I'm saying this and I'm being real, but I feel it's something we have to hear because too many men are going back. Too many men and fathers are going for the okie doke. Too many men and fathers are going for, the, for what they can get now. But it's not about now, it's about what we can give our kids for the future. I look at my grandkids. I look at them and what, what kind of church they're going to be. And I, you heard me say this over. I want my grandkids to say, that's not my grandpa's church. That's not my dad's church. That's my church. This is, my, this is their church. And so when you come to understand that Abba Father has more to do with just endurement, it has to do with obedience. Because there is a price to pay for disobedience. And as I look in, I look in this portion of scripture, I begin to see that our, our obedience determines our level of intimacy and obedience determines our level of love. How many love God? So we all love God. I was talking to an individual. I said, yeah, I love my family. I love my kids. But why are you doing what you're doing? I, I, I want to be there for my kids. I want to be the father God wants me to be. And I said, well, why don't you go ahead and just do this? Why don't you go in the home? Wouldn't do it. Why? Why do you think? But he says he loves God. I told him straight out, you love, you love money and you love yourself more than you love your kids. Why can I say that? Because I felt that one day. My disobedience, my selfishness, I'm being real. The things that I've done that, that I wanted for myself, the now affected my kids because of disobedience. I believe that God wants to raise up a family of fathers. We are living in a day where, listen, they, what good is, 
What good is bad and bad is good. Right? What, what, what had meant something doesn't mean anything no more. And it's not about religion. This is about a relationship. A relationship of who God is. And listen, God is going to raise us. God is going to raise us up to be that church. And because God is going to raise us up to be church, he's calling out here this morning for men who are willing to say, I want to be obedient. I want to be obedient because I'm telling this the consequence of disobedience. To this day, I regret. I want to go ahead and stand here tonight, this morning. To this day, I regret. To this day, my heart and my mind and my spirit regret. And I'm saying that to say, God, I pray that no one ever feels that. No one ever feels the regret that I could have did this. I could have did that. I could have been here and been there. I could have been a better dad. I could have spent more time. I could have really loved. I, I don't want anybody to sense that regret. But in order for us here this morning not to feel that regret is to be obedient. And I believe that this morning God is dealing with our obedience in many areas. In many areas that we're living in even now, God will deal with our obedience. Why? Because that is the key to our intimacy. If we say we love God, if he's our daddy, if he's our savior, he's our redeemer, he's our Lord, then we've got to understand that we're going to be called to be obedient. And I believe that this morning God is going to point out things, point out areas of disobedience, just like that. Areas of disobedience where God is telling you to do something, where God is telling you through his word, what is it? See, this morning we have fathers. We have many fathers here. And I know that many of us in our mind, we can rewind and say, there's things I could have did different. The devil used to beat me up like that all the time, make me feel not only regret, but make me feel condemned. It took me a little bit to get over it. it. Took me a little bit to realize that, listen, God still loves. Listen, when you're, when, you're God's, when you're a child of God, you're a child of God whether you're doing good or bad. We're still inheritors. You're still, he's still our Abba Daddy. But we got to understand that we're still called to be obedient here this morning. And this morning I wanted to be transparent because I believe that God is going to raise us up as a church. That many of you fathers here are going to be our leaders. That you are going to be the one that are at the forefront, that are going to lead the way. When God gives us that church, I said when he gives it to us, he's going to give it to us. But he's going to give it to us because there's an attack on God's plan and order. There's an attack on the fatherhood. There's an attack on our children. There's an attack on our children's children. Do you hear what I'm saying? On our children's children, there's an attack. Obedience is not just about us. Obedience is not just about now. It's about our future. And that is the message that God gave me. He said, it's about obedience. And I begin to look at areas of my life. Look, man, where are my little... And if you look at them, they're there. If we look at them, they're there. Because God is calling us out to be obedient. Why? Because we're, we're his children. We're hares. Amen. He, when we pass, God has, given, God has so much more waiting for us here this morning. God has so much more of a plan for us. And I wanted to share this because, listen, we gotta, as fathers, we got to protect our family. we got to protect our grandchildren. And as we draw close to God, you cannot draw close to God without obedience. Does that make sense? We can't draw close to without obedience. We just stay where we're at until we learn to be obedient. Every time you're obedient to his voice, every time you're obedient to the word of God, brings you closer intimacy. Can't get any closer to God than we are right now. That's what the Bible says. He can't love us any more than he loves you right now. But there can be a higher level of intimacy. And I, I, I sense that when, 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 God was, when God told our pilots, we need to pray more. We need to be a church that's praying. We need to be on the forefront of prayer. Because you know what prayer does? Prayer aligns our mind 
and transforms us so that we're able to see what God's perfect will is. When, you, when we're praying for our family, when we're praying for, for, for the church, it, it, it allows our mind to connect. It allows the spirit that Christ, Abba, Father, our mind willing to move to connect with the Almighty God. And it allows us to see what God wants to do. What is God's will for your life? What is God's will for your family? What is God's will for the church? It has to do with intimacy and obedience because that's what Abba means. Intimacy and obedience. Can't call him Abba, Daddy, without being obedient. Amen? I pray that this morning or this afternoon that it would be God who would speak to us. It would be God who would begin to just examine our hearts and examine our mind, examine our lives. Because it is he who called us out of darkness. In, Gal in Galatians chapter 4, when Paul is talking to the Galatian church, he's telling us, and you are no longer slaves. Why do you still live as them? You are no longer held in bondage. Why do you still come to the place where you live in fear? He's trying to get them to say, listen, God's your father, but he's given you so much more. It just takes us to be obedient. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Master. You know what I thought of? I thought of Father's Day, and this thought entered my mind. I said, listen, there's, I have a friend who said some bad things about his dad. And I thought, how many other people on Father's Day don't want to honor their dads? How many people on Father's Day do not want to give honor to their father because of what they've done? And when he told me that, I immediately heard his cry. I heard his cry of hurt. I heard his cry of not, like, not having what God intended him to have. And so maybe you know, you know someone, maybe you're out there and you're one of those people, you can be male or female, that you want to honor your dad, but there needs to be healing. Maybe here this morning, you're one of those who, who found yourself disobedient, and you can see the results of that in your kids. You can see that something happened because of that, of our disobedience. And like I said, this morning, I'm being honest, I can look back and say, man, that devil, he got me. See, he didn't only get me, he got my kids. And that stirred up a holy anger. God, I want more of you. I want more of you. I want more that you have to give me. Forgive me for my disobedience. Forgive me, God, that when you told me to do things or you want me to do things, I say no or I pretend I don't hear you. God, forgive me for when you're trying to mold and shape me to be that father and you're trying to create in me a pure heart and I'm doing it for God, forgive me. That this morning here we would be a people, especially as men, to allow God to make us those men that are, that only love God but are obedient to God. And as I told that individual, that you may be able to meet those needs but you can't give them what they really need unless God is with you you can't really be the father that God wants you to be unless unless the spirit inside you cries Abba Daddy if the spirit inside you is not crying Abba Daddy if the spirit inside you doesn't bear witness that you're a child of God then how can you give them what, what God wants to give them I believe that this morning God wants to minister to us. That God wants to heal us. That God wants to strengthen us. And God wants to change us. So I'm going to go ahead and open up these altars right now. Let's go ahead. I just want you to come. I want you to find a place. This, this is Father's Day. But let it be a, a, a Father's Day that God would transform your heart, your mind. That if you sense regret and you sense guilt because of something, you, listen, God wants to feed. He's your father tonight. 
This morning, he's your father. This morning, he wants to be not only your daddy, but he wants to be your healer. He wants to be the one that is able to touch hurts and pains away. He wants to be the one that is able to say, listen, I understand. And take guilt and shame away. Because he did it for a long time. It took me a couple of years to get over that. So this morning I pray that, that God would minister to your heart. That he would mend you. That he would touch you. That he would shut off the lies of the devil. That he keeps lying to you. And that you become that father that he wants you to be here this morning.